You guys ready to pray now? All right, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you tonight for everything that you have been doing in our hearts, everything you've been doing in the house, in this room, Lord, that every single life, Lord, every single one is within your sight, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that no one is here tonight by accident. No one is here tonight just because there was this happenstance and they stumbled in. But, Lord, you have called each one here. Because you're doing things and you're speaking things. You're going to continue to do that tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to invite you to grab your Bible with me and let's go to the book of Matthew. And we're going to start in chapter 25. I think that's where we're going to start. Um, So let me be just very, very honest with you. Sort of about um, this, this word and my approach to this word tonight. It's sort of where I am on a, on a heart level. So coming out of this past week, of course, the weekend, spring ramp, but even beyond that, um, if you go further back into the week, I feel like the Lord has been speaking just quite a bit to us. And as a house, as a, as a leadership team, our pastoral team. And so honestly, it's almost as though my mind and my heart have been enlarged over the last few days and so with that, I'm wondering, Lord, Lord, how do I engage sort of this new world you've invited us into? And that's the way I feel a little bit tonight is how do I engage this new world you've invited us into? Because I feel like I want to tackle all of it at once, but obviously we can't within one service. And if we try to, it's like we're just like in a very sort of general way hitting all of these things across the board. And so, Lord, is there one thing you want me to lean into? And so I don't have a lot of answers from the Lord other than just, I'm not quite sure, but let's just kind of start somewhere and see where we go. Um, Because I really want us to stay in rhythm (coughs) with God's heart for us as a community. God's heart for us as a community. Just stay right in rhythm with where he is. So I told you, Matthew 25, but let's actually go to the book of Luke, chapter number 1, verse 17. All right, so and we'll um, in in all likelihood come back to Matthew 25. So it's not bad that you went there. That way you know where it is. So when we need to go back, you you already know. All right, so Luke chapter 1, verse 17. So as you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a quick dream. And then we'll read this and then maybe share a few other dreams and then go to Matthew 25. So. Why are we going to Luke 117? So on Friday morning, it was Friday morning, wasn't it, Chase, that you woke up in the stream that you texted for the conference? Or Thursday morning, Thursday or Friday? Okay, Thursday morning. So Thursday morning, Chase woke up from a dream. And in this dream, um, he's kind of coming in uh, to the ramp for like a conference type setting. But everyone's outside in the front <clears throat> waiting to get in the doors. But he knows it's time for service to start. He's a little confused by that, like, um, you know, why isn't everyone going into, why isn't everyone going into the ramp? And so then he walks around to the back to where the green room area is, where our ministry team prays. And when he gets there, he walks in, and Miss Karen and I are sitting on these old, uh, sitting down in these old desks. He said it was like they were from the 1960s or 70s, like old high school desks, and we're sitting there just waiting. And so when he sees us, he looks at us and he says, um, you know, why isn't the conference starting? Why isn't everyone in the sanctuary yet? And Miss Karen says, we're waiting on the word of the Lord. And so Chase within himself thinks, well, then I want to get the word of the Lord. I want to know what the word of the Lord is. So he runs in here to the sanctuary. And when he comes in, he finds lying right here in the sanctuary this silver coin. It's a quarter. He says it's very old, like, like some of the first currency ever printed in the United States old, that kind of old. And he says he can't really see anything on it except, of course, the outline of George Washington's face. And the rim of the quarter is raised a bit, like quarters are. And he's examining it, and he knows that this quarter is somehow the word of the Lord for this conference. And he's looking at it, not quite sure what to do about it. And when he kind of turns, the light hits it in a certain way, and it says Luke 1.17. Luke 1 17 and when he sees this and he knows this is the word all of a sudden the doors open and whoo there's the rush of people coming in and Chase is fighting to get through the crowd back into the green room to tell us that he has the word of the Lord for this event and that's essentially the dream right, right? I may have missed a few little details but that's essentially the dream so 
Let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 17, and read what this verse says, and we'll start to unpack it a bit. Luke 1, 17. This is the angel speaking to Zechariah about his son John that we know as John the Baptist. And he is describing to Zechariah, he is describing to him the vocation of John's life. Here's what it says. He, John, will also go before him, Jesus. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children, to, I'm sorry, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And then watch this last phrase, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay, in this verse, there is a lot going on in the first part of it. He's going before him. That has sort of the echoes of Malachi 3, 1 that Jose spoke about last night if you're here for the service. The messenger who goes before the Lord to prepare the way has that element there. The spirit and the power of Elijah, of course, which then takes us not only to Elijah himself, but Malachi chapter 4, verse number 6, that talks about the spirit of Elijah that must come before the day of the Lord. What does the spirit of Elijah do? It turns the hearts of the fathers to the children. And then in Malachi, it says it turns the hearts of the children to the fathers. But in Luke, the Holy Spirit rewrites it just a little bit and says the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So a lot of elements at play there in Luke 1, 17. But the emphasis I feel tonight is that last phrase where it says to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so I've got a lot in my heart, and so Holy Spirit, help me deliver it in the way in which you want it delivered, in the order in which you want it delivered. I think that the Lord wants to teach us, emphasis on the word teach, I think the Lord wants to teach us how to reorient our lives around the return of the Lord. And it is something we're going to have to learn because for whatever reason, for a long time, it has been a muted message within the Western church. Not in every church, but in, in a lot of ways it has been. It certainly has been in my life until the last couple of years. Lord began to speak to me about it in different ways, and I'm, it's mass, still massive learning. And so I, I'm very intentional with the word teach. Lord wants to teach us how to reorient our lives around the return of the Lord and bring everything into alignment with that expectation. Now, that element of the Lord teaching us and us learning, I think that's why Ms. Karen and I are sitting in desks when Chase walks in because we're in a posture of learning. And so this message tonight is not necessarily... Here's a word, yes or no. I mean, yes, it sort of ha does have that. But it's much more, here's a word, let's go on a journey of learning together. And not just a one-time message. Not just a one-time, let me take notes and go apply this. Of course, there are things about tonight that you can do that with. But it's much more going on a lifelong journey of learning how to reorient your life by the power of the Holy Spirit around the return of the Lord. I'll give you an example of this. So several years ago, the Lord began to do a very strong work in my heart regarding Israel. And he began to rearrange some of my thinking, began to reorient some of my thinking. And it's like during that early, the early season of that, he's still doing that in me, but during the early season of that, it's like I kept expecting him to give me a message about it. Almost like, Lord, are you going to release me to preach sort of on Israel and then I kind of... I'm, you're giving me this thing and I'm preaching it and then I kind of go on to the next thing. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm not trying to give you a sermon. I'm trying to give you a paradigm. This is not about you getting a message for a church or the church and then going to the next thing. This is a new lens I'm trying to give you that reorients your world, that rearranges your world. And the way I feel about this thing of the return of the Lord, it's not a message or a sermon he's trying to give us. It's a paradigm he's trying to give us. 
It's a lens through which he wants us to interpret the world and our lives. It's a lens through which he wants us to rearrange some things. And so it's important for us to sit down at the table of the Lord and just learn and say, God, I... I have all kinds of crazy ideas. I have all kinds of preconceptions. I have all kinds of stuff that makes me hesitant to engage that issue, but I am ready to sit down at your word by your spirit and learn. This is really important for us to go on that journey together. And again, it's not going to be like a one-month series. I don't even know if we'll do a series. It's much more just my ears are open, my eyes are open, God, I want to learn. So I had this thing, and I, so I, I had this thing that happened. This was, I guess, maybe, I don't know, three summers ago. I, I would have to look at my journals to exactly know when. But a few summers ago, um, Delana and I went up to Buffalo, New York. And while we were there, we went up there to do a wedding. And then we also ended up ministering at our friend's uh, church, Bishop Robert Stern. So he's been here a couple of times. We'll, we'll be up in his neck of the woods next weekend. So this weekend, we're going to do spring ramp at, uh, in Ohio. And uh, Bishop's bringing a whole youth group down. About 40 kids are coming down from his church from Buffalo, and he's going to be there just to, to hang out, yeah, so anyway, so a few summers ago, we go up, and we minister there, and then we go on to do this wedding, well, in between, we're having a meal with uh, Bishop Stearns, and he looks at me, and he says, while you were ministering, he said, I saw a vision of, of you, talking about me, and he said, Samuel, Samuel Bentley, Jose, he was here last night, and he named a couple other people that is kind of in our peer group, he said, I saw this vision of you, and um, what I saw was, and as he was about to say it, somebody walks in and goes, hey, I'm sorry, so sorry, Bishop Stearns, we need you over here. He goes, oh, let, me, let me get back to that, okay? So I'm just like, okay. Okay, so we go on with the next meal. We're sitting there, and he goes, oh, yeah, round two. He's like, okay, well, uh, while you're preaching, I saw you guys, and I had this vision. And in the vision, I saw you, and this what the Lord said about it. And as he's about to tell me, someone else comes in, hey, I'm sorry, Bishop Stearns, we need you over here. Gets interrupted the second time. So I'm getting a little impatient. I'm like, <laughs> third time. This is a true story. Third time. He's like, okay, well, I had this vision of you guys. And in the vision, what I saw was a third time someone walks up. Bishop turns, I'm so sorry. And so he gets pulled away. Now, during that time, we, we go up to do this wedding and we're texting Bishop Stearns, and he's like, hey, we've got this speaker that's here tonight. His name's Dan Juster. He's ministering. When we wrap up, I'll text you. We'll grab some coffee after the service, and I'll finish sharing with you what I'll share with you. Well, that coffee appointment never happened. He still has never told me what he saw that night. We leave Buffalo, and I'm distraught. I'm like in the airport, and I'm during, I'm like, well, God, you're going to have to show me what Bishop saw. That so here's, what's, here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. Two week, about two weeks later, I have a dream from the Lord that we're having that conversation, me and Robert Stearns. I have a dream about two weeks later, and Robert Stearns looks at me in the dream and says, hey, we pick up the conversation. While you're in ministry, I saw this vision of you and Samuel and Jose and uh, some of these other guys. And he says, and when I looked at you, the Lord told me that you are the learners, the learners with a capital L, the learners. And when he said it, I knew exactly what he meant. I knew what he meant was this, that God wants to teach other people through our own learning process. That it's not necessarily that God's commissioning, a, commissioning a, us with arrogance to like teach this stuff from a place of like, I don't know, arrogance. I mean, that's redundant. I just said it, but... But it's much more with humility saying, hey, let's, let's learn some things from the Lord and let's just share the journey with other people. That, had a ma that still has a massive impact on my whole Israel journey. We can talk about that another day. But it was a very interesting thing. Now, here's the amazing thing about that. Now, that's already amazing. But here's the other amazing thing. So Wednesday night we're here and, um, you know, I minister Wednesday night to kick off college days. It was a word I was reluctant to preach, but I knew the Lord was commissioning me to preach it about how he hates modern progressivism. So as I'm preaching this, we end the service by asking the Lord, Lord, give us the love for the spirit of truth. We well, want to receive that. So Samuel, who's in the altar, did not know my story about Robert Stearns not telling me what he saw, but then God showed it to me in a dream. Okay, Samuel doesn't know that. While he's here in the altar, this happened Wednesday night, Samuel's here in the altar, he says the Lord speaks to him and says, I want to release truth through you, but I want you to take the posture of learning. 
If you'll take the posture of learning, I can use you to teach. But if you take the posture of a teacher, basically you'll be arrogant, and I won't be able to deliver something through you that I want to. So the Lord speaks that to him. I didn't know that. We're just up here, you know, just praying. So we get to the back, and we're kind of debriefing from the surface a bit. And Samuel says, man, God spoke to me. You know, Samuel. He said, man, God spoke to me. And he says, God spoke to me about taking a posture of learning rather than taking a posture of a teacher. I said, Samuel, did I ever tell you my dream that I had about me and you and some of these other guys? He's like, no. So I tell him the dream, and of course, you can imagine, he is flipping out. He is flipping out. And why do I tell that story? Because in this thing of the return of the Lord, when you, when you get on that topic, I don't know, they're, they're, in church culture, it gets so weird because everyone feels like they have to be right about certain things. And I think more than anything, the Lord wants to give us a heart of learning to say, we don't know all the answers, but what we want you to do is to teach us how to reorient our lives around the return of the Lord, around your return. We don't know what all it looks like, we don't know what it all means, but we're here, we're available, we want to learn, we want you to speak to us, and God just show us. And here's what it says, that John the Baptist he was sent to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So that makes me want to do two things. Number one, it puts it in my heart to say this. God, I want us to be a people who are ready for the Lord. I want, which means if he's making a people ready, that means you can be a people who are not ready for his return. We'll look at that maybe in just a minute, Matthew 25. You cannot be ready. And so it put it in my heart to say, God, I want to be a people not just a person, not just a few. No, can we be a people who are prepared and ready for the return of the Lord? Again, we got a bunch of questions, but we're ready to learn, Lord. Luke 1.17, we're ready to learn. So it makes me say, okay, God, we want to be a people, and then also use us as a John the Baptist people. Use us to make other people ready for your return. Use us to make, help make the earth ready for your return. Come on. Lord, use us in some way in your infinite wisdom, in your global plan. Use us to make nations ready for your return. I'm going to give you another one. Use us to help make Israel ready for your return. As he said, he said, Jesus said to Jerusalem, you will not see me anymore. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, I won't return until there is a rightness to Jerusalem that is ready to receive me as king. Maybe we'll get into that later on Palm Sunday. That's, a, uh, that's a, something else. Okay, for another day. So, Lord, can we be a people made ready and you want to use us? Because, listen, if we don't, if we don't orient our lives, and this is the conviction I think I'm, I'm arriving at. If we don't orient our lives around the return of the Lord, then we won't know what our assignment actually is. Because God repeatedly has spoken to this house, which you are a part of because you're in this house tonight. God has repeatedly spoken to this house about having a John the Baptist-like assignment. John the Baptist doesn't make sense without Jesus. Jesus said about John that he was the greatest one, the greatest man born among women. But we don't read about one miracle that he did. We don't read about one courageous act. We don't read about any kind of a, a press, a, a impressing resume about what he accomplished, like Elijah or Elisha or all these other guys. You know what he just did? He just stood up and said, get ready, he's coming. Get ready, he's coming. Repent, get ready, he's coming. Get your heart right. He's got, get ready. He's here. He, and just because, just because he got people ready, Jesus said he's the greatest. He's the greatest that's ever been born. But John's greatness doesn't make sense without the coming of the Lord. In the same way, if God has spoken to us about being a John the Baptist kind of people, then we have to understand 
something about the return of the Lord and orient our lives around the return of the Lord. Again, not in some kind of arrogant teacher vein where we know what we're talking about, but simply through a learning vein, could we become learners to say, God, teach us how to do this. Teach us how to be ready for your coming. Teach us how to be aware of your coming. And if we can carry it as a people, then God can release that through us as a people to get other people ready as well. Before John got Israel ready to see Jesus, John got John ready to see Jesus. He went out into the wilderness, and he fasted, and he prayed. And in that place, he began to hear the voice of God, which made him ready to perceive the Lord, to see him in his coming. Therefore, he was able to make other people ready. Are you guys kind of hanging with this? Is this all right? Okay. So the word for us... Luke 1 17 to make ready a people prepared for the Lord now from that thought let's go over to Matthew chapter 25 and see how you can either be ready either be prepared or unprepared to meet the Lord you can either be prepared or unprepared to meet the Lord Jesus in Matthew 25, it's, it's, it is kind of important to remind ourselves about where Matthew 25 goes. It's right after Matthew 24, and in many ways it is Matthew 24. Sometimes we like break it in our head just because there's a, there's a chapter break, and so we think that Jesus like, you know, took a break from Matthew 24, and the next day on, to, you know, it started on a different idea with Matthew, Matthew 25, but it's not. Matthew 25 is part two of Matthew 24. What is Matthew 24? It begins with the disciples asking him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus responds with Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. And so Matthew 24 and 25 come together as a package deal that are preparing his disciples for the coming end of the age and his coming as king to rule and reign on the earth. All right, so we got to kind of put that context in our head. Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. They all begin, watch this. I'm going to share a couple of dreams in just a moment to emphasize this. They all began with the same expectation. They all go out to meet the bridegroom. They all begin expecting to see the Lord. Verse 2, now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Just because you begin with the right expectation doesn't mean you steward that expectation wisely. You can begin with the right expectation and steward that expectation in a foolish way that leaves you unprepared by the time the day of the Lord comes. Five were wise, five were foolish. Verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil with, took, watch this, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Okay, verse 5, but while, no, no, not verse 5 yet, okay, okay, here we go. You guys, 3 and 4, we'll get to 5 in just a second. The wise took oil for their lamps, the foolish had a lamp but took no oil. Okay, hang with me right here. The lamp is the mechanism that houses the fire. The oil is the substance that gives the fire sustainability. The foolish had a fire but did not prepare their hearts to burn for the long term. The wise had a fire and prepare their hearts to keep the fire burning regardless of how long they had to wait. And one of the reasons why, in the, for the most part, the Western church has not oriented its life around the return of the Lord is because we enjoy fire, but we don't like waiting. We begin with the expectation He's coming, but when He doesn't come tomorrow... 
we begin to lose the fire of longing for him to come. Not necessarily our fire for church, not necessarily even our fire for miracles, not even necessarily our fire to see souls saved. We still carry fire in other areas, but the specific fire of longing for Jesus to return, that fire goes out when we don't see him next week. And it is foolish of us to begin with an expectation for his return, but to let that desire wane and no longer shape our lives because we don't see it in the time frame that we want to see it. And I just, I, I, this is the, the, the word I felt the Lord was giving me as I was just thinking through all of this. Our impatience is killing us. Our impatience is killing us. Our impatience in regard to the return of the Lord. That's why in Revelation chapter 1, John begins, as he's introducing himself, he says, I, John, your brother and companion, watch this, in the patience and tribulation and kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Three components to his experience. Patience, tribulation, kingdom. We like kingdom. We don't like patience. And we for sure don't like tribulation. Your brother and companion in the patience, tribulation, and kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the wise began with the right expectation and prepared themselves to burn with that expectation for the long haul. The foolish begin with the right expectation, but their impatience causes their fire to go out. All right, let's keep going. Verse 5, whoa. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. The challenge in front of us, and I'll share this more in just a moment through a dream. The challenge in front of us is to stay awake and to stay expectant. The challenge in front of us, if we are going to be a people who are prepared to meet the Lord. A people who are ready for his return, and God uses us to make other people ready for his return. Our challenge is to stay awake and to stay expectant. And not to allow the delay from when we began to believe and when he actually comes. We have to fight to make sure that delay doesn't lull us to sleep. If we're not vigilant and careful... The delay from belief to coming, in that delay, we will get, we will allow the spirit of the world to lull us into a place where our lives are no longer oriented around his coming. Now, I'm going to say something, and this is not a rebuke. I, I just want you to hear my heart. I want you to say something. I can just tell, and again, this is not me being harsh. I just want to be honest. I can tell by the atmosphere in the room that this is an uncomfortable topic. That it's almost like our minds, I don't feel it on a heart level, but it's like our minds are wanting to back here disengage because that, that whole thing of the return of the Lord has something about it that we don't like. So our minds, for whatever reason, are trying to disengage. And I say that not to rebuke. I say that to charge the room to say we are being commissioned by the Lord to be a people that are ready for his return. And not only are we ready and just like reading some books about maybe Jesus will come back on this date. But no, we are living in such a place that we are burning with desire. And God through us is making other people ready. And watch this. And this is the key. Our entire lives should be oriented around his return. And that is a big statement. And I have not fully yet wrestled with the, all of the implications of what it means. And that's where I want to learn. That's where I want to be a learner. That's where I want you to be a learner. So God through us can teach other people. What does it look like to orient our entire existence around the return of the Lord? What does that even mean for us? How does that change our decisions? How does that change our time management? How does that change our life trajectory? How does that change our dreams? How does that change our desires? Or do we see his return as inconvenient and interruptive to what we want to do? 
That's the whole thing about the, well, I can't get into it. The whole parable of the vine dressers. What, hap- what happens? And the master sends his son. And they don't want him to come back yet. So they kill him instead. It reminds me of that moment in Return of the King. I got to slide a Lord of the Rings example in there. <laughs> Return of the King. When Denethor, if you don't know who that is, that's okay. He's in the castle or in the fortress at Minas Tirith. If you don't know who that is, that's okay. And this prophet named Gandalf looks at him. If you don't know who that is, that's not okay. This prophet named Gandalf looks at Denethor, who's a steward. That's his title, steward. He's talking to him about the return of the king named Aragorn. And Denethor doesn't want to give up his control or authority. He starts getting a little crabby over the issue. And Gandalf looks at him and says, Who are you to deny the return of the king? And I feel like the Holy Spirit is looking at our disinterest in Jesus coming back. And he is saying, Who are you? To deny the return of the king. So, let me share with you. There's more in this parable, and maybe we'll get into it, maybe we won't. But I want to share with you some uh, dreams real quick. Is that cool? Okay. So, this first one comes from uh, Nathan Hamilton, who is here tonight. Is that your mom? She's here tonight, too. It's good to see. And uh, Nathan wrote that song that the choir just sang a moment ago. That was amazing. This is one of those dreams that I think we need to hear, we need to learn from, so we can be learners, so God, through our journey of learning, can, can prepare other people as well. Here's what he writes. I had a dream. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. He's texting me right now. He put a great message tonight as he's watching. <laughs> he knew I was looking at my phone. That's why he did that. <laughs> So, here's the dream. I had a dream that I was in the sanctuary of my home church in Cookville, Tennessee. And there was a guest worship leader. He was older with gray hair and a mustache. He looked like Ray Hughes. If you don't know Ray Hughes, he's this old prophet guy who's amazing. He was opening, as he was opening his worship set, um, I got the feeling he was a little bit old school by his casual way of talking before he sang. I walked in, and he was already talking, and he started making some comments about the return of Jesus. He said, so this older minister says, Jesus could even come back before we finish this song. Nathan writes this, I was immediately struck with fear because that thought sounded terrifying to me. I was aware in the dream that the only reason I felt that way was because my comfort was not fully rooted in the Lord. And I recognized my reaction as wrong. Nevertheless, that's still the way I felt. I was kind of like, Lord, I'm sorry. I recognize I shouldn't feel this way, but I do. Watch this next part. Then I began to reason to myself with the the uncomfortability of this news. I began to think to myself, well... People in the older generation grew up with a hyper-focus on the return of the Lord. So that's probably why he's saying that. The reality is Jesus is probably not going to come back before the end of this first song. I was reasoning with myself to keep myself from facing the uncomfortable reality that Jesus could come back in the middle of my unpreparedness. That was the dream. And I woke up once again praying, Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. This dream is so profound to me because it really describes, I think, where a lot of us are, at least in my generation. When we hear about the return of the Lord, something in our brains doesn't connect to it somehow. And you can explore all kinds of reasons for that. 
And then rather than wrestling with the reality of his return and the uncomfortability of what that may demand of us, we begin to reason in our minds that, well, that's what people did in the 70s and stuff, right? That's like what they did in the 60s and 70s. Like Keith Green, his ministry was called Last Days Ministries. And like that was a long time ago, wasn't it? And that's, that's kind of what they used to do. Now we've arrived at a def- different understanding. And all of that reasoning and subtle mockery of the generation ahead of us, what it's actually doing is not truly wrestling with whether or not Jesus is returning in our lifetime. It's actually just keeping us in a place of comfortability where we don't have to deal with it. I just want to tell you something. There is a people, there is a time to which Jesus will return. Why not us? And if it is us, if it is us, shouldn't we be ready? And if it's not us, shouldn't we live in a way that is making our children ready? So if it's them, they're ready to meet the Lord. And if it's not them, shouldn't we live in a way that they live in a way that makes our grandchildren ready? And even if it's not them, shouldn't we live in a way that they live in a way that our grandchildren live in a way that our great-grandchildren start to live? Don't we have a responsibility to watch and pray? And again, I'm not even sure. I can't give you point one, two, and three about how to live in such a way that your life is reoriented around the return of the Lord. Because I don't have that because it's something I want to learn. I want, it's something I want us to learn as a people. Okay? So a couple more things. Maybe one more dream, maybe one more scripture, and we'll just see where to go from there. So I was really struck by this. Where this whole thing came from is Sunday night after the service, Christy Mullis, I don't know if she's here tonight, but Christy came up to me, and she had had a dream just... Um, I don't actually know when she had it, but she shared it with me on Sunday night. So Christy came up and she said she was serving at a church where there was a wedding. Now that's already a good dream because Jesus, whenever he is describing his kingdom and his return, he many times will use a wedding as the imagery. So she said she's serving at a church where there is going to be a wedding. And the entire congregation, it's packed out, it's full, and everyone is waiting the bride and groom to come. Does it sound familiar? Matthew 25. All right, they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. They're all sitting there waiting. She says, but as she's standing there, she notices the congregation starts to get drowsy. And a lot of them start to fall asleep. And she is serving in the background, and she's actually at the door as a greeter, which is interesting. She's a gatekeeper, she's a watchman. She's at the door. (laughs) Hey, we'll get to that. In just a minute, in verse number six. Thank you, Jesus. All right, she's at the door as a watchman. Someone new walks in that had never been in the church before. When the new person walks up, she greets them loudly and unknowingly wakes up a lot of people in the congregation. And it's interesting how how many times a congregation doesn't realize how asleep they are until a new believer comes in. And all of a sudden... Their fresh zeal reminds us of what we've not guarded. And I want to live in a place, and I want to be a church and a community, that we live awake so that when new believers come in, they're called to a higher place. Their new zeal doesn't have to wake us up all over again. And I feel like, I feel like we endeavor to be that, but I want to be that even more. Say, God, just make us keep, I want to say, fully awake. So the congregation starts to kind of get, you know, awakened when she greets the new person coming in she said but all of a sudden when they woke up they all thought that they had missed the ceremony and they get up and they start leaving the sanctuary and she's trying to stop them saying no 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 no. he hasn't come yet he hasn't come yet and they all start walking out as though he had and it makes me think about this parable and other places in scripture where we are called to not only stay awake we are called to stay expectant There's been some kind of weird spiritual attack on the church to almost try to extinguish our expectancy for the return of the Lord. And in doing that, rather than being oriented around his return, we get oriented around earthly values. We start getting oriented around like temporary things and our whole lives and our whole definition of success get so rooted into this culture that we're not distinguishable 
in our pursuit from what the world's going after. It's like we're going after the same thing as the world, but we're using Christianese to get it. Rather than being oriented in a totally different kingdom with a totally different goal, a totally different agenda, and we are peculiar because we are expecting something totally different. We're expecting a king who is coming, and he's coming soon. So, let me read a scripture out of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll come back to Matthew 25. You don't have to turn there. Unless you want to, you can. I read this, this passage on Wednesday night, but I want to go back and read just two verses out of this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And it's amazing what Paul writes because it reveals a tactic of the enemy. Here's what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. I love that. His coming and our gathering. We ask you about his coming and our gathering to him. Verse 2. Here's what we're asking of you. Not to be so soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. This sounds a little odd, but Paul is saying, don't let anyone convince you that he has already come in such a way that he's not coming again. And that may seem a little odd, but that is a very real sort of surge in a lot of theological circles where it's like, don't talk about, don't think about, don't look at, don't expect his second coming. Only think about his first coming. Listen, his first coming is foundational, but his second coming is motivational. The reason why we're so paralyzed as the church is because we don't keep in view his second coming. If we kept his second coming in view, it would motivate us to tell the world about his first coming. But because we don't like to talk about his second coming, we just learn about his first coming and just kind of sit around like everything's been done. The work is not done. There is still things to do. There are still things to do before he returns. And Paul is saying, listen, there is going to be an assault from the enemy that tries to get you to believe that the second coming is not a big deal. He says it may come by spirit, it may come in word, or it may come in letter. But however it comes to you, don't let it shake you. Because of the day of the Lord, it is coming. It is sure. Now, what's the part that I believe God wants calls us to play? I'm going back to Matthew 25. I didn't read the whole parable. I probably won't read the whole parable tonight. But what's the part, what is the part that, that God has called us to play? So, remember, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 5. The ten virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. They all start going to sleep. Because even the ones that were prepared to wait, they still got drowsy. They still weren't fully awake. They still weren't fully vigilant. You know, they, they were prepared to wait. Some weren't even prepared to wait. They had the initial expectation, but then they lost their expectation. They lost that fire, that desire. The ones that were prepared to wait, they still fell asleep. But watch verse number six. To this sleeping bride if you will verse number six and at midnight a cry was heard behold the bridegroom is coming go out to meet him what happened a cry was heard what cry who would have who would have cried the watchman the watchman would have been waiting while everyone else was asleep and the watchman saw him coming before he came. And the watchman used his voice to wake up the bride so she could be ready to meet the Lord. It is undeniable that God repeatedly has spoken to us about being watchmen. That means we've got to have oil in our lamps. That means we've got to stay awake. 
That means we have to stay vigilant. That means we have to stay watchful. That means everything about our lives can't relax into this drowsy thing that is on the Western world that tries to live as though what we see is all there is and don't worry about anything else in the future and you just kind of walk around like you're half drunk all the time because you're, you're so numb. We are not called to live that way. We are called to live joyfully. It's not like this sorrow or this dread. We are called to live joyfully, expectant, excited, just awake and aware, eyes open, ears open, ready for the Lord, using our voice to wake people up. This is what we're called to do. And here's what I believe. Oh, Jesus. I believe as we learn, again, it's a learning thing. It's something that incrementally God will teach us by His Spirit. I'm not expecting you to go out here right now and start doing posts about five signs that Jesus come back tomorrow. I'm, you know, if God gives you that, I'm not mocking that, then, then yeah, okay. But what I'm saying is, I'm not trying to turn you into something. What I'm trying to do is say, let's learn how to reorient our lives around His coming. And here's what I believe about that. Lord, forgive me. I really do. I, I, Lord, I repent for saying that thing about the five reasons come back tomorrow. Because I, I don't want to mock anything that is calling our attention to the return of the Lord. There's way too much of that. And it is not of God. It's not. And so um, here's what I believe. I believe as we learn to reorient our lives about the return of the Lord, all of a sudden you're going to begin to get like this deep conviction about what your, what your role is, what your part is. If it's here in this city, some of you are going to just fresh vision for your role in this city. Some of, you, some of you are going to start dreaming about nations. Some of you are going to start dreaming about nations. Some of you are going to start seeing your, your place as a sentry, as a watchman at another ramp location. God's going to give you that. But again, I don't think that we're going to be able to get that in fullness until we get oriented around his coming. Why? Because John doesn't make sense without Jesus. And I don't think we make sense unless we're oriented around the return of the Lord. Otherwise, why are we doing all this? If he's not coming, why are we doing all this? But he is coming. And the Bible says he is coming quickly. And I love how, this will be the last thing musicians can come. I love how it says, and I know that we've been singing a song that has this a lot. We may sing it tonight. I don't know. I didn't tell the band what to do. I said, we're just talking about the return of the Lord. Let me just figure it out. But I love how it says in Revelation, John says it a couple times, even so, come Lord Jesus. Why does he add that even so? Because as he is seeing the return of the Lord, he's seeing a lot of stuff coming with it. A lot of stuff he doesn't understand. Some stuff God's giving to him as, with understanding. He's just in a lot of stuff. And it's almost like, I don't get all of this. But even so, even in the areas I don't understand, I still want to desire you. Even if it means shaking. Even if it means the world being turned upside down. Even if it means things that make me wrestle with who you are and why you would do things in that way. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If you will, I want to invite you to stand on your feet tonight. And I'm aware this was less of a message and more of a share. And therefore, it may or may not have a, a strong call here at the end for us to respond to. But here is the call. God wants us to reorient our lives around His return, around the return of Jesus. And tonight there's an invitation for those who are willing to learn. There's an invitation for those that are willing to embrace that process and say, God, I don't, I don't know, I've got all kinds of, I don't even understand all of my hesitations in, that are in there, but for some reason I feel weird about this topic. But God, I, I want to learn. I want to sit down at that desk. 
And I want to hear the Luke 1 17 message that you would prepare us as a people that are ready for the Lord. And Lord, through us, you do the same thing. So if that's you, if you're willing to learn and say, God, reorient my life, whatever the cost, I want to invite you just to raise your hand right now. It's a sign of surrender to the Lord. It's a sign of response. You may, if you don't want to, I know we're about out of the, some of our COVID restrictions, but if you want to come to this altar, you can go ahead and do that. I just want to get, create that space. Come on, I love that. I love that. Just, And I love, I love the humility of it. It's just like, God, I don't know. I don't know. But Lord... I don't want to be, I don't want to be in that sector of people in the dream. Number one, that fell asleep. And then number two, that left the ceremony before you came because I thought you already came. And so, Lord, we just lift our hearts to you right now. And we want to be learners. We want to be learners. We don't, we don't presume to approach this as teachers or know-it-alls or we got to have all the answers. We just want to learn how to reorient our lives around your coming. Lord, we want to be aware of your coming. We want to know, Lord, we want to be in sync with your heart. I don't even know the words to pray right now other than teach us, Lord. Teach us. Give us the desire. Give us the longing. Give us the burning. We receive it tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.